I'm Kay Darling. I'm a fellow here at the center. And things I'm supposed to tell you are, let me see if I can remember. So the hashtag for this, if you're following online, there's, there's the camera, is um, hashtag BKC Harvard. Hashtag BKC Harvard. OK, so I will monitor that if there are questions from the internet. Um, I'm also supposed to let you know that those of you who are new to these events should feel welcome to ask questions during the Q&A. You got free lunch, and here's how you can earn it. And um, books are available. This is a book talk. You can buy the book. It's, what, $29.95? And if you don't have cash on you, as many of us don't, Carrie can work something out with you. And um, you can also get your book signed, which I recommend doing because it will slightly embarrass Aaron, who is a very modest person. But people should, you know, get pushed out of their comfort zones sometimes. OK, so I'm, I'm actually really, really excited to have Aaron Przanowski here today. He is a longtime friend and collaborator. And uh, when I met Aaron, we were at this um, law conference. And he was definitely the most well-dressed person in the room. And I saw him, and I was like, guy's probably a total schmuck. <laughs> it turns out that I was wrong. So getting to know him, I realized that he's a complete badass in a lot of very good ways. And he's a, so he's a professor at Case Western. He does intellectual property law and telecommunications law. And he's also not one of those professors who just writes law review articles. He has actually practiced as a lawyer. He's been in the trenches. He's done, you've done work with the EFF, I believe. And he was also the Microsoft Research Fellow at Berkeley, which is something that I applied for many years ago and never heard back. So he's definitely better than I am. If that tells you anything, it doesn't tell you much. Uh, we have co-edited a book together that's coming out in February on the ways that communities and markets innovate without intellectual property law. But he's here today to present his other book, which he actually wrote together with Jason Schultz, who some of you may know. And I think it's an incredibly important piece of work. It's about the end of ownership in the digital age. And without further ado, I will let Aaron tell us all about it. So thanks, Kate, for the introduction. Uh, thanks to Berkman for having me. And thanks to all of you uh, for being here today. I'm really excited to get the opportunity to talk to you uh, about this project. It's something that I've been working on. It's kind of been on my mind for uh, quite a long time now. So th this book grew out of a series of articles that Jason Schultz and I have been writing since probably going back to about 2009, I guess, is when we started uh, this work. And you know the common question that all of these pieces that we had been working on, uh, the, the question they were all struggling with was really what does it mean to own something uh, in the digital economy? You know, consumers have, I think, a pretty good idea of what ownership means in the physical world. They understand that on an almost intuitive level because of kind of a lifetime of experience interacting uh, with physical goods. Um, but I'm mostly interested in uh, ownership of information goods, right? So IP kind of complicates that intuitive picture uh, to a degree. Normally, we think about IP as a set of rules that govern intangibles, right? They tell us when some creative work is inventive enough to be patented or original enough to be copyrighted or so similar that it is uh, infringing. Um, but from, the, from the perspective of consumers, IP is really a set of rules that tell us what we can and can't do with our stuff, right? Um, you know, can you sell that used book? Can you repair your car? Uh, can you brew the brand of coffee of your choosing in your kitchen? Um, for better or worse, IP has something to say about all of those questions, right? Um, so, you know, if you buy a print book, uh, like, the, like the ones that we have uh, here for sale today, you know, it, it becomes your personal property, right? It's, it's like your favorite pair of shoes or your toothbrush. Um, 
you own it, right? And ownership means you can do a lot of different things with it. Um, you can lend it to a friend, you can give it away, you can resell it, you can leave it to someone uh, in your will. And all of those rights that we sort of take for granted come from this principle of exhaustion, right? And exhaustion is basically the idea that once an IP holder sells a copy of a work uh, to someone, they lose the rights. Their rights are exhausted uh, as applied to sort of downstream further uh, uses or distributions of that particular copy. So in copyright law, we talk about this in terms of the first sale doctrine. Um, but you know, this, this, this doctrine and this principle is, is embodied not just in copyright law, but patent law and trademark law as well. It's the reason that we have used record stores and used bookstores. It's the reason that we have eBay and public libraries. Um, it's, you know, the reason that we can lend a novel to a friend, right? So as I said, exhaustion is, has been around in uh, our IP law for a long time, going back in the patent context at least, you know, about 150 years. And it's a fundamental component of IP. And in part, that's because it, it polices this really important line uh, between intellectual property and personal property, right? I, I could talk all day about the reasons exhaustion is, is really fundamental, but I just want to highlight a few of what I think are the most important things that it does in this system. One thing it does in copyright in particular, right, is that it gives consumers an incentive to participate in the copyright marketplace. Copyright is asking, asking something uh, pretty remarkable of consumers, especially today. It's saying, you know that free stuff on the internet? Why don't you pay us for it, right? Uh, buy my book instead of downloading it for free. Well, why? Well, one reason uh, is that you might be uh, afraid of infringement liability, and that's one possibility, and I think that stick uh, motivates some people. But there's also a carrot, and the carrot is if you pay for this thing, you own it, and by virtue of ownership, you have certain rights that a stranger does not, right? By owning this book, you can read it. You can read it as many times as you want. You can write notes in the margins. You can give it to a friend. You, you, can, you can set it on fire if you want to, right? You can do whatever you want with this thing because now you own it, right? So that's crucial for the copyright system to function, that we have some uh, uh, reason for consumers to participate here, right? Exhaustion is also crucial because it helps keep information costs uh, in check, right? So um, if you think about the end user license agreements that accompany most of the digital products that we buy, and I'll talk about these more in a few minutes, um, they're incredibly long, they're incredibly detailed, uh, and they impose massive costs on consumers. If you actually stop and read all of these legal terms before you buy things, um, you know, it's, it's a massive obligation. And of course, that's why no one does it, right? The iTunes license is longer than Macbeth. How many people are going to read that before making a 99-cent purchase? So through exhaustion, right, by insisting that transactions take uh, one of a number of identifiable forms, it's either a sale or it's a gift or it's a rental, right? You know, these are... These are um, classifications that come from our experience with physical goods that we understand intuitively. We don't have to invest uh, those, those resources in understanding these sort of uh, idiosyncratic bundles uh, of, of rights. Now, the other thing that I think exhaustion does that's really crucial is it contributes to a sort of sense of consumer autonomy. Uh, the idea that you can act without seeking permission uh, with respect to the things that you own, right? So we can make choices about how we use, how we modify, uh, you know, how we transfer products without asking anyone if that's okay. And we can do that by virtue uh, of ownership, right? And, you know, we're talking about here products and devices that, that we use uh, to communicate with one another, to create new things, to, to move through the world, and, and actually in some instances to actually survive, right? 
one of the things we can talk about is you know, the ownership of medical devices that keep people literally alive, right? The stakes can be really high here. Um, so all that said, um, the main story we're trying to tell in the book is the erosion of this notion of exhaustion and the rights that flow from it. So what I want to do today is kind of highlight a number of, of uh, developments that have kind of undermined this really crucial principle. And the first one uh, is really the disappearance of the copy itself, right? The sort of traditional source of consumer rights. So, you know, for most of copyright's history, we've interacted with works uh, through physical copies, right? We read hardcover novels, uh, you know, we rented video cassettes, we listened to records and tapes and CDs. And so the thing that we owned, you know, was that tangible copy, right? So now today, of course, we occupy um, a world where that particular unitary physical copy has been de-emphasized. It's not nearly as important as it used to be, right? In part because of digital distribution, uh, in part because uh, we've moved from models that are premised on purchasing to models that are purchased on sort of um, subscription or temporary access, right? So the copy used to be crucial. Copies used to be rare. They used to be valuable. They used to be persistent. Uh, and now they're the opposite, right? Copies are everywhere. They flit into and out of existence around us all the time. And no one particular copy has much value whatsoever, right? So I guess I should be clear here. Um, I think sometimes our, our argument is confused for one that's saying all of these new developments in distribution are bad for consumers, right? That we should be skeptical uh, of you know, Netflix or Spotify or the cloud or, or what have you. Um, and we don't, we don't think those developments are necessarily bad or harmful, but we do think they involve a set of trade-offs that consumers might not actually be fully aware of when they make choices in, in the marketplace. So what we're trying to do in part is just make people more aware of the upsides and downsides of, of each of these choices. So that's problem number one, right? The thing that consumers own, the sort of token you could hold in your hands uh, to illustrate to demonstrate your ownership has uh, has been de-emphasized, right? Problem number two here is the way in which courts have redefined the notion of ownership, right? So one of the central questions uh, in the world of exhaustion in copyright and patent law uh, is who counts as an owner, right? These are rights that apply to owners. So question number one is, well, who is an owner, right? And you know, it used to be easy to figure that out, to answer that question, right? To know if a consumer was an owner of a particular copy. This was not a difficult or controversial exercise, right? So courts would ask questions like, do you get to keep it forever? Do you have some ongoing obligation to pay, or did you pay once and now it's yours? If the answer to those questions is yes, guess what? You own the thing, right? We get an illustration of that here. Um, so uh, this is the uh, first page of a novel published by the Bob's Merrill Company in uh, 1907 called The Castaway. Um, and this was the first time the Supreme Court ever confronted the question of copyright exhaustion. So uh, they publish uh, the book with this notice that says, the price of this book at retail is $1 net. No dealer is licensed to sell it at a less price, and a sale at a less price will be treated as an infringement of the copyright. So you bought a copy of this book, and you sold it for 89 cents rather than a dollar. That makes you a copyright infringer. That's their theory. The Supreme Court looks at this and says, what are you talking about? These people own these books. They bought these books. They can do with these books what they damn well please, right? Uh, that's a sort of intuitive understanding of, uh, of personal property rights. So this kind of proto end user license agreement does not get the Bob's Merrill Company uh, one step closer to its wish of controlling downstream prices, right? Um, that was in 1908. Today, things uh, look a little bit different, right? 
Um, that simple picture of ownership starts to break down uh, in the 80s and 90s uh, and into the 2000s in cases dealing with computer software, right? There, lots of courts have said that an end-user license agreement that announces it itself as a license rather than a sale is enough uh, to avoid uh, transfer of title, to avoid consumer ownership, and to avoid this doctrine of exhaustion. Now, the law here is a mess. Um, I want to give you uh, what I think is the clearest illustration of the mess when it comes to answering this really simple and fundamental question of who owns this copy, right? And I want to do that by contrasting two cases. These are both cases that were decided by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. They were both cases decided by the same three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. They were two cases that were heard in the same courtroom on the same day, back to back, by the same three judges, and they are totally inconsistent with each other, right? So the first one uh, is a case called UMG versus Augusto. It has to do with these promotional CDs. Uh, these are CDs that record companies will send around to uh, DJs and bloggers and other sort of uh, influential people in the music world uh, for free in hopes that they will uh, play uh, these, uh, these songs or share them with their audience. And this CD is interesting uh, because of the text here around the side, which you might not be able uh, to see clearly. So let's turn this around and zoom in. Here's what it says. This CD is the property of the record company and is licensed to the intended recipient for personal use only. Acceptance of the CD shall constitute an agreement to comply with the terms of the license. Resale or transfer of possession is not allowed. And the CB, CD may be watermarked, which in fact it wasn't. Um, so this is interesting. So they send you these things in the mail for free without asking for them. What happens if you get one and you don't want it? If we believe these terms, you are stuck with it forever, right? <laughs> resale, fine, let's, you know, let's, let's get rid of resale. Or transfer of possession. I can't give it to you. I can't say, I, this, this showed up in the mail, I don't want it. Can I put it in the trash? Am I allowed to throw it away? Is that a transfer of possession? I'm not sure, right? So the label say, look, it says right there, we still own this thing and we're telling you what you can and can't do with it. It is not sold to you. It is not given to you. It is licensed to you. And the Ninth Circuit looked at this and said, no, that doesn't work, right? You can't impose these kinds of sort of ongoing obligations, these sort of servitudes on a chattel, right? You can't impose legal obligations that kind of travel around with this disc. Despite this language, the people you sent these CDs to owned them, and they could give them away, they could resell them, and Troy Augusto could find them in the racks at Amoeba Records and buy them for $2 and sell them on eBay for 20 That was his business, right? Uh, so here the court kind of sees through this self-serving language and recognizes consumer ownership. Again, same day, same court, same three-judge panel, same question, who owns the five-inch plastic disc inside this box? This time it's not a music CD. This time it is software, right? It's uh, Autodesk's AutoCAD software. And Autodesk makes the same sort of argument. They say, look at our license terms. Uh, the license terms say license not sold, you're not allowed to transfer, uh, and we restrict the kinds of use that you can make of our program, right? So is this a sale or not? And the Ninth Circuit in this case says, okay, well, to answer this question, we have to uh, use this sort of three-part test. We ask three questions. One, is there a reservation of title? Do you say license not sold? Two, uh, do you impose restrictions on transfer? They did. Three, uh, did you impose, as the copyright owner, restrictions on the use of the software? And they say, well, look, all three of those questions, the answer here is yes. Therefore, you don't own the software disk. The problem is if you ask the same three questions about the promotional CDs that we just looked at, the answer there is yes too, right? Uh, so a really deep inconsistency here in these two cases. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. I see one big difference. The uh, music CD was unordered and, uh, and there was no money transferred. It, it, it is the same as if I, sorry, 
It is the same as if I received a book in the mail from Amazon that I never ordered. The federal law says I'm allowed to keep that. So this, this is a good point. If, and if you didn't hear the question, it is, what about the fact that this is unsolicited merchandise? And there's actually, there's federal law on this point, right? Um, that says if you receive through the post unsolicited merchandise, it's yours to keep, you own it, right? This is to avoid sort of bad behavior where... I assume the autocad is not held to be unsolicited. That is true. Um, the, the federal postal statute was not the grounds for, it was, it was an independent basis for the same conclusion. But even just thinking about this from the perspective purely uh, of copyright uh, and the terms of these license agreements, um, not factoring in the postal code, um, we get this discrepancy in terms of ownership, right? Now, there are other reasons. There are other things that we might... was unsolicited. So that's, a, it's an interesting, that's an interesting question, right? Do you have more or less of an ownership interest in a thing you got for free or a thing you paid $8,000 for, right? I actually don't know how to, how to resolve that. It's a really interesting discrepancy, right? Yeah. There's also another interesting uh, issue. Sometimes you get a, a, a software at an educational price or something. Mm -hmm. Especially discounted price and you have restrictions on how you can transfer it, or you get a limited use license, and you have restrictions on extending it to a larger machine or something. So how, how do you blend those restrictions in with your current issue? So we do have scenarios where software is sold at different prices to different groups of users, right? And there are lots of pro-consumer benefits to that. You know, if you're a student, you might not be able to pay the full sticker price, so maybe an educational license is really valuable. I think the key question is, what's the body of law we use to address violation of those terms? Does it make you a copyright infringer, or does it make you, uh, you know, a, a, a breacher of contract? And the proof for those violations is very different. The remedies for those violations are very different. I think the way to resolve the scenario you're describing uh, is to rely on the law of contract rather than the sort of quasi-property interests of, of copyright. Um, so we get this discrepancy between software goods and non-software goods. Part of what I think is going on here is a sort of sense of software exceptionalism um, that the courts are latching onto, that software is in some really important respect different. Uh, and that might be one of the reasons that it's different, because we have these very different strategies for how we sell or distribute uh, goods to consumers. And part of that has to do with the history of the software industry itself, right? So early in the software industry, it was really uncertain whether there was copyright or patent protection at all. And so licenses played a much more important role early on. That means that, that, that consumer expectations might be different when it comes to software-based works. Um, so there are reasons to, to kind of explain this difference. I don't particularly find them convincing, and we can come back to this um, if, if people, if people want to um, dig into this question a little bit more. But you know, one response to this might be, okay, well, we can, we can sort of separate off the software market and let it play by its own sort of different set of rules, but the rest of copyright law uh, and the rest of the economy can go on kind of um, uh, as they were before with these notions of, of personal property and ownership, right? And the, here's, here's the problem with that, right? Uh, what, what's depicted on this slide, maybe it's an airplane, a car, and a watch. It's just three different shapes and sizes of computers, right? That's what we're looking at here. Um, software is everywhere. You cannot quarantine software to the market for little disks uh, of, of AutoCAD software, right? So I, I want to move on and talk about a kind of related problem here, uh, and that's digital rights management, right? The, the kind of software-based restrictions that, that dictate how you can uh, use products uh, and content, right? Now, you know, the early examples of DRM, things like this, CSS and, and the region coding system for DVDs, they were sort of at least plausibly connected uh, to uh, reducing copyright infringement, or at least regulating works that we think about as kind of within the core of what copyright is interested in. You know, these measures were, were largely about market segmentation, price discrimination, um, elimination of arbitrage. But there was a story to tell about how they promoted the goals of the copyright system. It did not take long 
until we kind of reach the logical breaking point of the DMCA. Um, Lexmark has been on this sort of decades long crusade to stop people from refilling ink cartridges for their printers. Um, and one of the first tools they tried to use was DRM and the DMCA, right? So they had code uh, on their printers that would detect whether or not you were using an authorized Lexmark cartridge, if you were using a third party cartridge, if you were using a refilled cartridge, uh, the software would prevent you uh, from uh, using your printer. Now, luckily the Sixth Circuit heard this case rejected the DMCA claim here. That has not stopped Lexmark. They've moved on to patent law as their preferred means of restricting how consumers use their product. Uh, if you notice the little green triangle at the top of the box, it says return program cartridge. What that means is that Lexmark will sell you this cartridge at a discount um, so long as uh, you abide by a license that restricts uh, refilling or remanufacturing the cartridge. And if you have the audacity to refill your cartridge with ink, they don't say you've breached a contract, they say you've infringed their patent, right? Um, this case, that, that logic was, was recently uh, upheld by the Federal Circuit. Um, a cert petition has been filed in the case. The Solicitor General's office, maybe about two weeks ago, filed a brief uh, supporting the cert petition in this case. So we might hear uh, more on this question from the Supreme Court. This is my favorite recent example of DRM. Uh, this is a patent that uh, Apple recently got uh, on using this infra infrared uh, light technology to disable recording uh, camera use on your iPhone. So uh, those little boxes labeled 590 send out this uh, infrared signal. Your phone picks up that signal and when you go to hit the record button, your phone displays this message that says, Sorry, recording has been disabled by some third party, right? So this is great. You know, if you're like a, if you're a band that doesn't want people recording your videos and putting them on YouTube, or you're like a comedy venue that doesn't want people putting, uh, you know, new uh, comedy routines up on YouTube, uh, or if you're a cop and you don't want people to record what you're doing, right? Just build this into the, into the, the lights on, on the roof of your police car. Right? Um, all of a sudden, uh, all those pesky videos uh, of police doing things, they shouldn't go away. Right? This is an example right, of how technology can be used to turn your devices against you. The things you think you own um, don't uh, follow your instructions. Right? So you know, it's, like, it's really easy to make fun of the Internet of Things. Um, does your air freshener need an app? No, no, the answer is no, in case you're wondering. Um, would you like to spend 11 hours trying to make tea with your smart tea kettle? Uh, this is my favorite, the Smartress. The Smartress sends an alert to your mobile phone whenever someone <laughs> is using your bed in a questionable way. After that questionable use, you can follow up with the Bluetooth-enabled pregnancy test, right? Um, like, we could do this all day, uh, and it, 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 would, it would be entertaining, right? But that's not the real problem I see with the Internet of Things. The real problem I see is the Internet of Things is really the Internet of Things that you don't own, right? We know uh, that the cloud is just someone else's computer. Well, the Internet of Things is just someone else's computer in your house or on your wrist or in your body, right? Um, so we see all sorts of efforts to restrict... Um, ownership of physical devices. This comes from uh, Cisco's website. Um, Cisco explains in this Frequently Asked Questions document uh, that if you buy used Cisco hardware, you do not own and are thus not entitled to use the software that is embedded in it. Buy the hardware, they say, sure, but you've got to come to us uh, to get a license for the software that actually makes the thing operate. John Deere has been telling farmers the same thing, right? So uh, the modern tractor has dozens of, of electronic control units that have embedded software that make the thing work, right? Uh, and without access to that code, you can't do things like repair your John Deere tractor. Well, 
Who owns the software that's embedded in a $50,000 tractor? According to John, to John Deere, it's not the farmers that paid $50,000 for the tractor. They told the Copyright Office recently that, quote, the vehicle owner receives an implied license for the life of the vehicle to operate the vehicle. We own the code, but we'll let you use it, right? I don't know how reassuring that is. GM has been saying the same thing uh, when it comes to cars, right? Um, Here's another example of, of sort of machine mutiny. Uh, this is the, the, the uh, Keurig uh, 2.0 coffee maker that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, like Lexmark, they don't want you to buy cheap off-brand coffee. They want you to buy their expensive branded coffee. And if you make the mistake of buying the wrong brand of coffee, here is what your machine tells you. Oops, oops, uh, this pack wasn't designed for this brewer, stop being cheap, go to the store, buy our coffee, and until then, no coffee for you, right? This machine is refusing to make your coffee, right? Uh, we might see this as, as problematic. Um, you, you might remember this example from a few uh, months ago now, uh, Nest uh, remotely disabled the Revolve Home Automation Hub. They issued this press release that essentially said, hey, you know that device you bought for 300 bucks that controls uh, all the other smart devices in your home? We don't really like it anymore, so we're just going to kill them all, right? The app won't work, or sorry, the app won't open and the hub won't work. So remember that when Google tries to sell you a car. Um, I want to talk really quickly about uh, one more problem because I, I want to hear from all of you, but I think this one's really crucial. Um, here's the final problem. And it's, it's a problem that deals with the way these transactions are presented to the public, right? So we've all been to Amazon. Uh, we've all bought things from Amazon. We've all clicked the buy now button on Amazon. Um, it's the same buy now button if you're buying a Kindle book, if you're buying a hardcover book, if you're buying um, a, a bag of kitty litter, right? Like whatever it is you're buying on Amazon, you're buying through this uh, same buy now button. What does that terminology, what does that marketing language mean to consumers? How do they understand it? That's the question I'm really interested in. And one of the reasons I'm interested in it, is, you know, a few years ago, Amazon, and I'm sure a lot of you remember this story, uh, Amazon got into a dispute with a publisher about who had the right to sell certain books, right? Um, among them, George Orwell's 1984, right? And so until they figure it out, they say, okay, well, look, we're going to pull 1984 from the Kindle store. We're not going to sell any more copies because we've got to figure out who the real copyright holder is. And also, all those thousands of copies we've already sold and are living on people's Kindle devices, let's just delete all those, right? So you go to bed, owning a copy of 1984, right? Uh, the PR department at Amazon apparently had the week off. Um, and you wake up the next morning, and your copy of 1984 is sort of uh, down the memory hole. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so what does this language mean? What, do they, what rights do people think they have when they buy now? Um, so my colleague Chris Hofnagel and I decided to study this. So we created a fake uh, internet commerce site and um, had 1,300 internet shoppers use it and surveyed them uh, about what rights they thought they acquired in digital goods when they clicked a buy now button, right? Um, so this is the button they saw. And this is what they told us. These are the rights that they thought they had. And it turns out for ebooks, MP3s, and digital movies, a really high percentage of people thought they had rights, for example, uh, to keep the thing they bought for as long as they wanted, uh, to use it on the device of their choice, to lend it to friends, to give it away as a gift, to leave it to someone in your will, even to resell it. Uh, and the answers to all of these questions are at or above the threshold for false and deceptive advertising claims, um, both under state law, under the Lanham Act, and under the FTC Act. Uh, so we think this is a real problem. People are mistaken about the rights that they acquire. And the reason they're mistaken is, at least in part, because they're kind of porting over these expectations from the physical world that they associate with terms like buy and own uh, and applying them in the digital context. So uh, just to wrap things up, we. We showed them, instead of a buy now button, this short notice that told them, these are the rights that you get when you click this $5.99 button. These are the things you can do 
and these are the things you cannot do. And what we measured was a, a significant reduction in the levels of consumer confusion. It didn't go away altogether, but they saw this short notice once. They saw it for about 30 seconds or less. Uh, and so we think there is a, a way of addressing this issue. So, you know, we're at this really crucial point uh, in the development of the law and really kind of the notion of ownership uh, and personal property. And important choices have already been made um, that have sort of set a particular trajectory for what these notions are going to mean to consumers moving forward. And those choices have been made for the large part um, without people fully understanding these issues, not knowing that the ground is sort of shifting under their feet. And so what we're trying to do with this project is, is, is really make people aware of these trade-offs. We're not advocating for any sort of particular marketplace behavior. Uh, we want people to understand that these choices have consequences, uh, and that's the message that we're trying to, uh, trying to deliver. Uh, so I, I could go on, but I'd rather stop here and hear from all of you your thoughts uh, and, and questions. Thank you for this talk. Sorry, my voice is a little. Um, thank you for this talk. I think it's it's really helpful to to see this, and especially the study you did at the end. I was wondering, have you done any research or talked to people about what it looks like outside of the U.S.? Because this is a very U.S. specific analysis. Yeah, that's a great question, um, and there there are a couple of ways to answer it, right? So, on the one hand, the conversation. Um, internationally has been driven by litigation. So the Lexmark case that I just talked about a few minutes ago, one of the questions there is how do we make sense of sales of patented goods that happen outside of the United States? The Supreme Court in the copyright context a couple years ago decided this, the, the Kirtzang decision, which some of you may know, that was a case involving uh, a graduate student in the US from Thailand uh, who imported uh, textbooks that sold in the U.S. for $200 um, but were available in Thailand for $10 or $20, right? Imported them, sold them on eBay, uh, paid his way through graduate school, right? Um, and you know, the, one of the important questions that comes up in this context is, you know, what are the broader kind of global implications for a regime of international exhaustion. It's, it's a little bit easier to get our hands on what the consequences are of international, or sorry, of national exhaustion, where sales within a particular country um, lead to these kinds of consumer rights. Do those rights cross international borders? And one of the worries that I think we have to take really seriously uh, is that an international exhaustion regime could have uh, dramatic consequences for people uh, in less developed economies, right? And it's a, it's a worry that we have to take seriously, right? So if it's the case that you can buy books really cheap in Thailand and import them into the United States and sell them at a profit and undercut the publisher, um, what happens to that market for cheap books in Thailand? Do they raise prices? Do they pull out? Those were the, the threats that publishers made. Um, it's a really tough empirical question, and I don't think anyone can tell you with a straight face they know the answer to it. If they do, I, th I think they're missing something. Um, I can't tell you the answer to that question. It's a question I worry about and take really seriously. Um, it's really tough to generalize, right? Because there are, there, are, um, there are economies where for books, for example, um, we see really low prices for books in less developed economies. There are also examples where books are much more expensive than they are in the United States and international exhaustion might actually bring those prices down. Um, 
I do not know the answer, but it's a question that we have to take really seriously. The other, um, the other international component of this is to think about how these same questions play out uh, in Europe in particular, where there has been uh, litigation and more attention. Um, and there, the, the story is somewhat more optimistic than it has been in the United States if you're arguing in favor of a kind of digital exhaustion regime. There's the Ustoff case, uh, which said that consumers can resell uh, digital software licenses. Um, there's been litigation around ebooks as well that, while not sort of um, procedurally final, give some indication that there's, a, there's an openness to the idea of consumers having rights in digital books that are similar to physical books as well. Um, but again, when you're talking about that question within the EU, that's very different from talking about that question on a kind of global scale. Thanks so much uh, for this talk. It's pretty interesting. And um, one of the things that I'm curious about is um, how consumer understanding of this ownership uh, sort of impacts um, pricing in business um, because it seems to me that the buy it now is the, like based on what you explained is trying to like convince the consumer they're getting more than they paid for. And so um, is there a sense that as um, knowledge diffuses about these bundle of rights or if you present it the way you did that like consumers will be willing to pay less for the smaller bundle of rights or yeah. pay more for ownership has that impact the market that's a it's a great that's a really great question we tested this because we knew this was a really crucial piece of this puzzle so it's one thing to say that consumers are misinformed or consumers are confused or even that consumers are deceived but we also have to establish that that deception is material to their decision making in the marketplace would they behave differently if they knew the truth. And we tried to get at that question in a way that would kind of make a positive case, you know, for our um, short notice disclosure. So what we asked consumers, um, what we asked consumers was, would you be willing to pay more for the right to resell or the right to lend or the right to use a particular uh, work on your device of choice? Right, to get a sense of what the dollar value is to consumers. Um, and we asked the question in a it, it sort of intentionally, um, in, in terms of survey design, in a conservative way. How much more would you be willing to pay? Um, and we got positive results. Um, the average price increase for each of those three rights that I mentioned was around $3. So people were willing to pay more. Now, of course, they're willing to pay more in like imaginary money that's not coming out of their pocket, right? So I mean, we, like, you've got you've to take that with a grain of salt in terms of the actual magnitude of the price increase. But I do think it suggests that people do place real value on this. And I think it's an opportunity for people that are trying to sell these sorts of products to the public um, to actually compete on what kinds of rights you're giving people. Um, Right now, there's no incentive to do that, right? Because the, the lack of rights is, is sort of hidden from the average consumer. Um, so, you know, one thing I would like to see coming out of this research is um, digital retailers and copyright holders uh, taking uh, more seriously the idea that there could be a market advantage by actually giving consumers the kinds of products and the kinds of rights that they value. Hi, I'm also very interested in uh, this, the study that you did. Um, did you collect demographic information and did you, do you have any specific findings about that? And also I'm curious as if you looked into uh, the differences in the video game industry about DRM and yeah. Yes, um, so our sample, we had 1,300 people that responded to our survey and uh, they were representative of census data on kind of all the big um, uh, demographic uh, distinctions. Um, it's tough to generalize too much uh, about um, 
who had a more accurate understanding of their rights. But I think it's fair to say um, that white men between the ages of 30 and 50 were the absolute worst at answering these questions correctly. Um, there was a kind of notable sense of entitlement. <laughs> there was this idea that like, yeah, I get what I want, right? I want these things, I value these things, so of course I get them. Um, older age demographics performed better. They were, they were more accurate in their perceptions. Women on average performed better. They had more accurate perceptions. Um, beyond that, it, it gets pretty messy pretty quickly in terms of um, making any generalizations uh, about, about demographic groups. Um, we talked a lot about doing this kind of work in the video game industry. Um, frankly, our budget just didn't allow us to do another product category, but if I got to do another one, it's definitely the one I would want to do because resale plays such a huge role in the video game industry. And I think consumers in that space are much, much more attuned to these issues, um, mostly because they're engaging in resale and lending and trading a lot more than consumers are when it comes to these other kinds of work. So that's definitely uh, on the short list for follow-up work. Can you talk a little bit about the um, maybe the music streaming services, Amazon Video, where the bargain is maybe a little bit more explicit? Do you yeah. think that those services are getting things right? Do you think that there are problems with those ones as well? I think there are problems, but I think they're very different sets of problems, right? So I don't, and I have to say, I haven't tested this. I haven't done real research on this question, but my intuition is people are not confused in this same way uh, when it comes to Spotify or Netflix or other kinds of streaming subscription services. Consumers understand that if I don't pay my bill next month, that stuff goes away, right? I have to keep paying in order to have access to it, so I don't I don't worry about the sort of deception component of it, um, and I think there there are lots of really great pro consumer features of those kinds of temporary access models. The price point tends to be much lower, so we get greater accessibility to a much broader cross section of consumers, which I think is like a really wonderful development. Um, so you know our argument is not that consumers should avoid those options. It's just that they should take seriously um, the potential downsides, right? And so, you know, some of these examples seem sort of trivial, but in the aggregate, I think they're important, right? So we've all had this experience where there, there's a movie on your Netflix queue and you're like really excited to watch it when the weekend comes and then, and then it's gone, right? Like the license expired and they've pulled it, right? Um, that's not the like worst thing in the world. Um, but imagine the sort of power that gives um, these sorts of technology platforms and copyright holders to remove works from public accessibility, right? There's a work that for whatever reason um, a copyright holder thinks is uh, you know, politically sensitive or embarrasses them in some way. They can just make it disappear if we live in a world without physical copies. Um, Try to go out and buy a VHS copy of Disney's Song of the South, right? You won't, right? Um, it's tough, right? Like, they want that work to disappear, and it is under lock and key, and they're never going to make it available. Should they have the power to deny a disturbing but culturally significant work from public view? Like, that's what worries me. When, when we distribute copies into lots of independent hands where they can't be clawed back, um, there is uh, an opportunity um, for sort of, you know, uh, archiving, uh, distributed archiving that goes away when we're just kind of relying on access to data on someone else's server. Do you think that um, it seems that a lot of the decisions around these issues are driven by kind of a sense of fairness? even with the judges, and that uh, even when we look at these different examples you give, there's kind of a collective, well, that's fair and that's not fair, even if it's hard to articulate the difference. And so do you think that 
what's happening now will ultimately shift people's sense of fairness around this and that you know in 25 years if GM turns off your car when you try to resell it it won't bother people so much so this is the danger of rooting any argument in consumer expectations right because consumer expectations shift they are malleable things they are manipulable and honestly that's what we're trying to engage in here we are trying um, to advocate for a particular set of consumer expectations in the face of a shift that's going in the other direction, right? So this is, this is a contested space. And I think we need perspectives on both sides of, uh, of, of that dispute. Um, fairness is, I think, really key in understanding this debate. Um, one of the reasons that we have uh, situated our argument in the language and really the, the rhetoric of property is that it's really powerful. Um, IP rights holders have been incredibly successful in talking in terms of property. That's how they win these cases. They go in and say, we own this software. This software is our property. Because it's our property, we get to dictate how it is used, right? And what I think has been missing from the conversation is the recognition uh, that the property of IP rights holders shares a border with the property rights, the personal property rights of all of us as consumers. Um, and so we talk about property in large part, I think, to, to kind of tap into those intuitions about fairness. How successful that will be uh, is, is uh, certainly an open question at this point. I, I don't know where the mic has gone. Okay. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. I'll apologize in advance for the depressing nature of this question. Um, as I was sitting here listening, there were sort of echoes of you know the privacy debate that you could almost you know cut and replace um, copies and digital rights management with privacy and the same discussions about well maybe if we label websites more correctly you know then consumers um, you know would would make proper decisions and as many including you know Bruce has documented quite well that hasn't turned out very well at all. Um, what do you think can actually be done to, to change the trajectory here for, you know, for ownership? <clears throat> so the, the parallels to the privacy world, I think, um, are, are important and instructive. When we presented our work before we had um, data uh, on this idea of short notice, this is one of the responses we got was, we've tried that. Short notices don't work, right? Good in theory, um, they don't seem to make an impact on people's behavior. And I don't know that we can fully explain what's different about this one, but it did, it did make a difference, right? Um, and you know, my, my co-author on this project, Chris Hufnagel, is a person who um, works in, uh, in the privacy world and is, I think, very... Uh, attuned to, to those kinds of um, those kinds of precedents. Um, all I can say at this point is, for one reason or another, uh, the people that we surveyed seemed to um, take these concerns about ownership um, to heart in a way that maybe they haven't in the privacy. Context. I don't know if it's because they can um, more readily um, assign some dollar value to what is being denied them if the harm is somehow more concrete. It's not like, well, somebody might get some information and then maybe use it for some nefarious purpose that I can't quite imagine. It's someone telling you that book you bought might disappear tomorrow or that movie you might want to watch isn't compatible with that device. And somehow that is more immediate. But that's the best explanation I can offer. I have the microphone, so I guess I get to speak. I think you've basically only tipped, uh, 
touch the tip of the iceberg of a much bigger problem. Let me give you some additional scenarios. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are doing cloud computing these days where they're essentially licensing software like Microsoft Office or some database product, and they have a lot of their personal data that can be only accessed through that product. Now, the vendor of that product can decide to change their licensing term and now say, well, if you don't agree to this change in the licensing term, you no longer have access to all of your data. So that's a case where it's much worse. In the privacy world, you have this conundrum where you have cases like WikiLeaks or the North Koreans with Sony releasing something that gives, does a lot of harm to someone. Someone got fired at the Democratic National Committee. Sony got very embarrassed. Mm -hmm and no one seems to have been able to really do much concrete about it. But on the other hand, when Gawker released something about Hulk Hogan, he, he won a huge award that drove them out of business. So there's a lot of inconsistency in the law when it comes to privacy of personal data that's leaked. But I think the problem is a lot worse than you've pointed out, and it may be even harder to solve. So I, I think the point about data portability is really crucial, right? The idea uh, that when consumers entrust a platform, uh, not only just to store data about them, right, but, you know, especially as we have devices uh, that are learning about our behavior, right, monitoring what we do, building profiles um, for us, about us, based on our behavior, I, I do think there is an increased need for consumers to have some sort of right to access and perhaps control the use of that data. Um, I think you're right, it's a broader problem than the one that we're addressing in this book. We had, to be frank, a chapter uh, on those issues that like, didn't quite fit in with um, the scope of the project, but it's, it's, on our, it's on our radar for future work, absolutely. I, thank you for this provocative talk. Um, so one can imagine, um, thanks to you and to others, that the deception goes away and consumers are completely well informed. Um, and at which point, um, maybe there are, as you uh, talked about, there are already uh, times where your consumers are given a choice to rent or buy. Amazon does this for their videos sure. all the time. And so we end up, let's say, with lots of tiers of choices um, and we get to pay and decide, and that would, in one sense, buying may be gone, but that sounds like it's a good thing because there's more consumer choice. So what, um, I want to raise the question of, um, <clears throat> we can, you're arguing from property, and you've explained why, and it's, it's very interesting. Um, but if we're only thinking about this in terms of property, we could end up with a system where the deception is gone, we have lots more consumer choice, but we end up killing culture. Uh, because it costs more money now to get something in a way that we can share it and thus build culture around it. Um, is there anything we can do to, um, from, the, from sort of the cultural pressure side to try to um, get back this, these norms? So this is part of the reason that we make great efforts to try to articulate the value of this notion of exhaustion and the rights that flow from it. Um, and, you know, I, I just touched on them briefly, uh, but, you know, but preservation and privacy uh, and consumer autonomy and all of these things are sort of wrapped up, uh, or at least or at least have been wrapped up in this notion of ownership. And so trying to explain to people why that matters, trying to point out the value of user innovation, for example, right? Things that might go away in a world where we no longer have kind of the freedom to operate with respect to the, the things that, that we acquire. Um, it is... Uh, Risky in a sense, right, to make an argument that says, oh, what we really need to do is correct this misinformation in the market and then we rely on people to make better choices. Um, there are some signs of hope, I think. Um, the, the only, uh, there aren't many, but here's one. <laughs> um, the only uh, sector of the music industry that's growing as fast as Spotify is the sale of vinyl records, right? Um, 
there are people. Now, in, in absolute, this is growth in percentage terms, not in absolute terms, um, but there are people and will continue to be people um, who strongly prefer and are willing to pay a significant uh, uh, price premium for something tangible, for something durable, for something that is theirs. You know, we've uh, 10 years ago, you know, there were all these predictions uh, that hardcover books were going to be a thing of the past and that ebooks would, would be dominant. And that story has turned out to be like a lot more complicated than, uh, than a lot of those suggestions um, that we heard at the time. Um, on the other hand, look, if it turns out that we as a culture do not value these things and we would prefer just to pay you know, $9.99 for access to everything, whatever everything is, uh, and we just want to sit back and consume and not kind of engage and interact, um, there's not a whole lot that, um, that I think I can do about that, you know, other than to try to you know, point out the virtues of, of this, this, other, this other path and see if anyone is convinced by it. Yeah, I think um, it's a bit continuing on that question, but um, I don't know, when I think of a world where my tractor or my plane or my watch uh, you know, contains in it, the heart of it is something that I don't own, I, I feel like this is a future that's like, the worst parts of capitalism and the worst parts of communism combined. Um, and so I, just, I think it's interesting to think about private property more as sort of from something that we really need to be um, you know, protecting and nurturing. And so I'm just wondering, some of your own reflections as you've gone on this journey, do you, are you sort of feeling or identifying values and things attached with our sort of physical world conceptions of tangible um, ownership uh, that you think are values that we need to be uh, you know, ensuring that, uh, you know, basically defending and fighting for mm -hmm. as we move to more and more digitally based um, you know, items? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really important question. Um, so the arguments, the fact that the arguments are rooted in this language of property, I think is, at least from my perspective, really instrumental. Um, property is not valuable in itself, right? The reason that I think property is so crucial here is that it functions uh, as this sort of stand-in for individual freedom. Right, that it gives individuals the right to make choices without asking anyone for permission. Right? Um, you, know, you, like, you buy this book and you want to lend it to someone. You don't have to ask a publisher or you know, um, get a key from a server in order to do that. You just do it. Um, 30 years ago, if you wanted to repair your car, you just put it in your garage and you opened up the hood and you did it without asking anyone for permission, without uh, having to go to the Massachusetts state legislature and get a right to repair bill passed, right? To engage in this sort of um, accepted normal uh, um, you know, uh, behavior, right? Um, and so if we could get beyond the language of property and talk purely in terms of consumer rights or consumer freedom, frankly, that's a set of, that's a set of arguments I'm more comfortable with uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but trying to articulate these points within a kind of existing legal and cultural framework, this right now I think is the best language for doing it, although um, I have I have some reluctance uh, about relying too much on the rhetoric of property. I think this is our last question. Hi, um, I was just curious if there have been any court cases um, involving medical devices, and if you could give an example. So there there have not yet been court cases, as far as I know, about medical devices. But we talk about a handful of 
examples in the book uh, where we have you know individual users of medical devices uh, who wanted to improve their functionality, who wanted to um, satisfy themselves about the security and reliability of those devices. And that's really tough to do if the code that makes them operate is locked down, right? And one of the things you'll hear in response is, well, look, we can't have the average consumer like fiddling with their medical device because you know these are these you know th there, there's liability involved what if they mess something up and what if the device harms them we're the only people who can be trusted to kind of look under the hood at how these things are operating and you know who made the same argument um, about opening up the hood in a literal sense um, and preventing harm it was the car companies Right. Uh, this is like what Volkswagen was uh, was telling the U.S. government when it came to the software, uh, you know, on their vehicles. Right. And we know how that turned out. Right. There, there is value in having multiple perspectives on these questions. And I don't think that we can trust um, device makers to be acting uh, in anyone's best interest but their own. And I think the, the Volkswagen examples are really um, uh, really powerful one. Um, so uh, to, to answer your question directly, no litigation uh, so far on medical devices, but but we do have um, you know some some anecdotes that I think are cause for reflection. Thank you all so much. I'm happy to stick around if, if people uh, want to chat afterwards.